Uh, my name is Sam Coved, and I'm here today to talk about Cube Archive, why you should not use Kubernetes as a database, and how you can use Cube Archive to avoid doing that. Uh, before we get started, I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat. The last six months, my team and I have been working on Cube Archive. Cube Archive allows you to write Kubernetes objects of any kind that you have on your cluster into a database allowing them to be removed from your cluster without losing any of that data. We have about 35 minutes, so I aim to get through the presentation and a demo, if you wait for us to get through the slides, with about 10 minutes left for Q&A at the end. So to answer this question of how we got here, we need to know, we need to start back at the beginning. Kubernetes makes developing containerized applications really easy. For all the reasons we know, this is a fun list of the ones that you can find if you go to the Kubernetes website. Specifically, this has made, um, led to big investments in many different companies because of how much developers like Kubernetes to investing money into infrastructure specifically for Kubernetes. And this has led to pushing more than just your containerized application workloads into Kubernetes. Um, and we can, and so that's where you can start to run into some problems. And to understand why you can run into a problem here, we need to understand a little bit about what goes on under the hood. At, and we're not going to go super in depth in this talk, but we're going to kind of see this at a high level. And that'll, I think, give us enough of an understanding of what, how, yeah, how this causes the problem. Um, everything about the state of your cluster is stored in etcd. And for our purposes, etcd is just a key value store. It does a whole lot more for Kubernetes, but for our purposes, that's what we're going to be focusing on, that it does. Um, every time you create an object in your cluster, all of its data in the YAML format is stored in etcd. Uh, the size of etcd is configurable. By default, I believe it's two gigabytes. If you read the etcd documentation, you can make it bigger. However, they recommend strongly against making it no bigger than eight gigabytes. They say that should be the biggest you make it. Um, Objects tend to be small. Um, if you take your, any object that you want to create, if you've got a YAML file, you can just cat it out, and you can ask for the size of that string, and that's about the size it'll be in etcd. Um, and so the only way that, it, theoretically, it's like 8 gigabytes, that's a lot. These objects are like maybe a couple kilobytes at most. So you're going to need a lot of these. Or you're going to need some huge application that requires a lot of objects to sort of represent in Kubernetes to get it to run properly to actually fill up this database. And just keep in mind the like lots of small objects because with this move to workloads in Kubernetes, we now have Cloud Native CI CD. And this Cloud Native CI CD is this lots of very small objects that build up over time. And to be fair, Cloud Native CI CD tools are not the only uh, culprits here. Even your batch v1 Kubernetes jobs have this same problem where it's a, it's a workload. It runs once for a relatively short period of time. And then when it's done, it doesn't, like a pod, actually leave the cluster as an object. It stays there in its completed state, taking up space so that you, the human, that wants to know about whether what happened when this thing ran can actually go and ask Kubernetes, like, did this complete successfully? What was the error code? What outputs did it maybe make? Um, and with, if you're following your CICD best practices, what you're going to have is every time a change is made, you're going to have one of these things get created by Shipwright or Tecton, or if you're doing, if you've got like daily tasks that have to be run on the cluster, your jobs. And these will build up over time. And then with your CICD best practices, you're also going to have um, lots of small releases. And that's also going to start piling these up as well. Uh, this model, with this model, if you don't do anything, you've now essentially just turned your cluster into a glorified 8 gigabyte database. And so this is a problem that the Tecton community realized. And they came up with Tecton results. And what Tecton Results does is you can tell it when my pipeline run or my task run finishes, can you store the object in a database and then remove it from the cluster? 
And so this then frees up your space on the cluster to run workloads that are actively providing you value, and you're using the best tool for the job, which is in the year 2024, you should be using like something like a SQL database, maybe Postgres, like Tekton Results is using, where you can store potentially ted, like petabytes of data instead of only eight gigabytes. But the problem with this is Tekton Results is only focused on Tekton. So you're only going to be restoring your task runs and your pipeline runs. But you might also be using Shipwright, or you've got Kubernetes jobs, or you have some other operator that is creating these objects too. And these objects won't get cleaned up by Tekton Results because it's not designed for that. But what if we could have something that is, provides the same kind of functionality as Tekton Results, but can work with any object on your cluster using for any resource, even ones that you create yourself? Introducing Cube Archive. So Cube Archive was inspired by the Tekton results pattern with the goal of bringing this to everything. And so we've got the goals of here. More specifically, Cube Archive wants to allow users to specify what kinds of objects on their cluster they want archived specify what criteria these objects need to be made, need to meet to either be written into the database or be deleted from the cluster, as well as providing an interface to retrieve the objects that matches as closely the Kubernetes API as we can to make it easy for users of Cube Archive to understand how to interact with the data they already have. Uh, as well as, and then also make sure that the only people who can access data that is stored by Cube Archive are the people that have permission to view that data as if it was on the cluster already. And as well as integrate with logging backends so that if you have your Kubernetes jobs, Tekton task runs and pipeline runs, you can still access those logs that they produced. And then for our non-goals, Cube Archive is not attempting to be a backup and restore tool. If you want to back up and restore a tool, Valero has a really nice operator that can do that for you. You can go to valero.io and they have docs on how you can set that up. We also do not intend to do our own log storage. We plan instead to integrate with tools like Elastic Stack or Splunk to be able to leverage their ability to store and query logs to actually be able to provide you logs for your, your things back. So we don't, want to be able, we don't want to be in the business of storing the logs ourselves directly. So how does Cube Archive actually work? We'll start with how Cube Archive actually receives data. Cube Archive uses Knative Eventing's API server source to receive cloud events when an object of a resource that you specified has either been created, updated, or deleted on the cluster. These messages then get sent to the to Cube Archive, which has a sync component, which sits and listens for these cloud events to come. And when it receives a cloud event, it processes that cloud event and uses filter uh, cell expressions that the user provided, which are stored in a filters config map. And it takes that object, shoves it into the cell expression, sees what in the cell runtime comes back, and it, if it returns true, Cube Archive. Uh, if, it, if the hold on, hold on. Uh, there's two expressions you provide. You have a when archive and a when delete. Or archive when and delete when, my bad. Um, and so if either of those return true, Cube Archive will go and write the object into the database. If when delete returned true, after the, after the object is successfully written to the database, it will turn around and make the request to the Kubernetes API to delete your resource. And when users, if you change the filters that you provide to Cube Archive for when objects need to be written and deleted, the Cube Archive sync will actually re react to the config map updating and it will recompile the cell expressions and start using the new cell expressions that you have instead of the previous one. And so we've got a representation of the object workflow where the Kubernetes API tells 
the API server source that a resource is, that an object has changed or been created. This cloud event gets sent to the cube archive sync. It processes the object through the cell expressions, and depending on which ones return true, it either it may write to the database or it may turn around and make the request to the Kubernetes API. And so now that we have our data stored in the database, we need to actually be able to read it back out. Cube Archive has a REST API that has the, that is able to read any of the objects that you have stored through Cube Archive back to you. It uses the same API endpoints that the Kubernetes API uses to make the to make interaction with Cube Archive as easy as possible and try to make it as much like the objects are still on the cluster as we can. All you have to do to make these requests is you just change your base URL from the Kubernetes API to the base, to the base URL of the um, Cube Archive API. And to do handle the user authentication and authorization, we farm that out to the Kubernetes API server itself. When you make a request, you send us your user, you, the, user, the token for your user on the cluster or the token for a service account that you have on the cluster as part of your request. We send that token to the Kubernetes API to do the token review to see if this is a valid token on the cluster for a user. And then if it is, we get back your user and group. And then we combine that with, if you're trying to get resources from the database, we combine that with your get verb. And then we do a subject access review where we send the request, we send out a request for subject access review of your user with your group and the get of the resource that you want, either cluster-wide or namespace. And the Kubernetes API comes back and tells us whether or not if you're authorized or not. And if you're authorized, we'll send you back the data that was in the database. And if you're not, we'll just send you a, I believe it's 401, unauthorized. And then lastly, Cube Archive uses a Cube Archive config custom resource. And this is the resource that actually is how you define, you provide the when delete, or delete when, archive when, what resources you want in your names, in your specific namespace archived in the database. Cube Archive has an operator that sits and listens for new Cube Archive configs being created or being updated. And it will reconcile those. And so when you create or update your Cube Archive config, it will turn around and add your delete when and archive when cell expressions into the filters config map for the sync. It will provision an API server source to listen to the resources you provide in your Cube Archive config so that the Cube Archive sync will actually start receiving cloud events for those resource types. And this is the example of what the cube archive config actually looks like. You've got, you can name it whatever you want, but you've got your namespace, and this is going to be the namespace where it's cube archive will start listening for resources. And then if you're familiar at all with the Knative Eventing API server source, you'll see under resource selector um, the API version and the kind of the resource you're interested in. And that actually just gets used straight into the API server source configuration. And then the resources is a list. We've got only one here with event. And then you have your archive when and delete when cell expressions. So for these, we're just looking for uh, status dot state to be either completed or not. And now that we have an understanding on a high level of how Cube Archive works, let's actually see it in action. So I intended to have a display mirrored to my laptop, but I wasn't able to get that working. So it might be a little bit janky with getting the video playing. But I will try to narrate this as we go. Oops, we're looking at the wrong thing. Um, yeah, let's get this back. Oh, I need to. Technical difficulties. Hold on one moment. Oops. And then, 
Oh, yeah, I see what I did. I'm going to erase this. Figure out which one is the second one. Is this the... So first, I'm going to pull up the cube archive config here. We, we have the namespace demo tecton. We are going to, we're creating our cube archive config for it. We're going to be listening for tecton pipeline runs. And we've set our archive when and delete when expressions. So for archive when, our cell expression is saying we're waiting for pipeline run to have status start time, which will be added when the pipeline run actually starts. And it will actually write, and will only write as well, excuse me, when we have the status that start time, so the pipeline run's actually running. And the pipeline run needs to have the label archive equals yes. And then we will delete if the pipeline run has a name that ends with dash test, and it has a status dot completion time which gets added by the Tecton controller when the pipeline run actually finishes. And skip ahead a little bit. And so I'll kind of explain what we're seeing here. There's a few things. So we've got up in the top left, that's where I'm actually just running commands to apply this, the cube archive config to the cluster. And then on the right side, is the logs for the cube archive syncs. You'll actually see when those things appear. And then on the bottom is just a watch of the Postgres database that cube archive is using. So you can actually see what's in here. And so I have already in there a pipeline run and a job. Those will be relevant later when we actually have added data that we'll see get added in the demo. And so we've applied the cube archive config. And so now what we're looking at is the pipeline runs that we're actually going to run here. They're all the same pipeline run. They're all going to run the same pipeline. But what you'll see is that the first two have the archive yes label. So these will actually get archived. And then only the first one has a name that ends with dash test. So that's going to be the only pipeline run that will get deleted from the cluster when it completes. And then we have a third one, which has neither the, ar the uh, archive yes label nor end with the dash test. So that one will not show up in the database at all when it actually runs. So scroll down and we'll close and we'll flip back and get it applied to the cluster. And so we'll see here, I failed to mention before we started, we can actually see in the sync logs that when we created the cube archive config, we have in the logs that it realized that the filters config map had changed and that there were now uh, filters created for the demo tecton namespace. And you can see that it reacts to creating them and it logs that it had finished creating them. And so we apply our pipelines and we can see the sync receiving a bunch of cloud events about the pipeline runs as they change, as they're running, and it processes them sometimes depending on the filter criteria, and we can see in the database view at the bottom, if hopefully everyone can see if the text is big enough, but that we now have our two demo tech, we now have our two pipeline runs in the demo tecton namespace that have been added. Here at the bottom, you can see when they were created, when they were last updated, as well as we can see that only the hello goodbye run test and hello goodbye run pipeline runs actually got archived and that the third one we had actually did not show up. We can see that only one of them was successfully deleted, which will be the Hello Goodbye run, which I believe I go back over, and we're going to list all of our pipeline runs in the demo tecton namespace here. And you'll see that we'll only see the Hello Goodbye run and Hello Goodbye run ignore, because Hello Goodbye run dash test ended with dash test 
and so Cube Archive actually deleted it from the cluster. And you can see that it's in the database, but Cube Archive actually deleted it. And so we've got another config here. We're just going to do one more. It's, we're doing the same thing, this time with just our Kubernetes jobs. We're doing the same thing. Archive when it has a start, a status at start time, which gets added by Kubernetes when your job actually starts. It's going to, and we can only write when it has the right yes label. It's just showing off. We can use whatever labels we want. And then we will only delete with jobs that start with daily dash, and they have to have status at completion time. Go back to this view. Unfortunately, our logs are a little cluttered now, but we'll see once we get the config applied that it updates, that the sync realizes there's now filters for the demo jobs namespace. Oops, let's go back. And that it has recompiled the filter cell expression. And so now we'll just look at the jobs that we're going to create. We're going to do a similar thing. We're going to have three jobs. It opens. Only our first one starts with daily dash. So that's going to be the one that we'll delete when it finishes because it, and it will also get written to the database as it changes because it has the right yes. The second one only has the right yes label. So it will get written into the database, but it will not actually be deleted from the cluster when it finishes. And then. I will scroll down and you'll see in a second that the last one has neither a name that starts with daily dash nor the right yes label. So it will not show up in Cube Archive at all. So we'll just apply this back to the cluster. Once we do that, we'll see a similar thing with the Tekton pipeline run where we'll get a whole bunch of logs from the sync that our jobs are running and it's receiving them and processing them. And we can see get written. We now got our another job in daily job written in the database there. And we will also see that daily job got deleted. Another job is still there, even though it's in the database. And ignored job does not show up at all, because it did not meet our criteria for writing or deleting. And so now we're going to try to get the data back out of the database. So we're going to create some service accounts. For this one, we're going to create our service accounts in the Tekton namespace. So Cube Archive supports, as of right now, cluster-wide gets on a resource type. So if you want to look at any job or any pipeline run or any whatever kind on your cluster, you can do that. We also have a namespace request. So to show these off, we're going to create two service accounts. Our first one is Debian Tekton cluster. It's going to get a cluster role binding and a cluster role to give it permission to get all of the pipeline runs on our cluster. And then there's a second one when I scroll down that you'll see, you kind of see a little bit at the bottom right now, that is just going to get permissions to read pipeline runs in the demo tecton namespace. And these are going to be the, these will generate, these will get us our tokens to be able to use to create, to perform our HTTP request to the Cube Archive API. And we remember back to when the demo started. There were two pipe, there was one pipeline run, one job that was already created in different namespaces than where we were running our pipeline runs and jobs. And that's going to come into play now when we receive our results. So we make a curl request. We're just port forwarding up at the top. But you can see here if I pause, oh, let's go back. It's, it's a little rough. But we've got the same API endpoint that you would use to get this from the Kubernetes API, where we're hitting 
APIs, Tekton dev, v1, beta1, pipeline runs. This is, so we're hitting the cube archive API. We're going to pipe it through JQ just to get some nice formatting there. We make the request, and we will get back the JSON representation of our pipeline run object. And we can skip ahead a little bit as I scroll up through them. But we had three pipeline runs, one that already existed before I started the demo, one at the end, and uh, we created, we had two more get written into the database. So we do JQ length here. Yeah, you can see we've got, it returns back a length of three. Yeah, sorry about that. And when we're back here, we can see we've got our two pipeline runs that we created right there, as well as this other pipeline run in the other Tekton namespace, which I had created before this demo, to show off that when we actually do the cluster-wide get, we can actually see things that are not just in that one namespace. We can see all the namespaces because our service account can read all the namespaces, all the pipeline runs on the cluster. And so we're going to come back, and we're making the request with our other service account now to get just the namespace request here, where it's essentially the same route. Instead, after the Tekton dev v1 beta 1, we're inserting namespaces demo Tekton to just only get our specific namespaces pipeline runs. And so when we do this, we get our big blob here of our list of two JSON objects. You can have fun with all the fun JSON stuff. Oops. And then we add, we just do the length here. We'll see that there is only Sorry about the small text, but we see that we get back to this time because we only had the two pipelines in our demo tecton namespace. Because that second service account only has permissions to view pipeline runs in that namespace, so we only made the namespace request. And we can see that we had our two, oops. Here we only have our two pipeline runs in the demo tecton namespace in the database. And so we'll do the same thing with the job. So we're going to have two service accounts with one with cluster permissions to read jobs, the other with just the namespace permissions to read the job. And we'll apply it. We'll make the request. And with the jobs again, we're making our cluster request. We're going to get three jobs because we have an extra job that I had created before the demo in a different namespace. We can see all that. We got our three jobs there. And then we will do the length, and we'll see that we get three again. And we can see, oops. Now we're going to do the namespace one. We'll get back the two jobs in our demo jobs namespace. Beautiful JSON. We can see our two jobs right there that we actually got back. And we got the two from here because we only have two jobs in our demo jobs namespace. And we can fast forward through here. And then now we're actually going to make a request using our demo tecton cluster service account to try to get, and it's wrapped a little bit poorly, but our instead of trying to get a pipeline run, we're going to try to get a one of the batch v1 jobs cluster-wide. Unfortunately, notification, forgot to read those. But we get back a response on authorized because the demo tecton cluster service account does not have permission to read jobs. And then it works similarly with
where, and we're going to, I'm going to now do the same thing with the demo tecton, uh, the demo tecton jobs, with the demo jobs, um, or demo, uh, the demo jobs namespace service account to try to get tecton pipeline runs from a namespace that has permission to read from, but it does not have the permission to read the pipeline runs from that namespace, and you'll see that it's going to get unauthorized as well, because it does not have the right permissions to read that. So that's, that's our demo. Now I can get back to the presentation. Uh, so with that, there are still features that we're working on with Cube Archive. We're only six months or so in. For example, one of the things we're working on is having a CLI so that when you're configuring all of your service accounts and what resources you're trying to archive, you make it easier for you to actually just query and you don't have to use curl and these long requests there. Um, additionally, we're going to get support for global filters right now. The filters only apply to the namespace the cube archive config is created in, but we want to be able to allow cluster admins and stuff to say, I want cluster wide. If your pipeline runs just done, it's getting archived. So you don't have to do that every single time in every single namespace that you create. Um, additionally, you might not, we kind of passed through the JSON objects, but it does not actually return the logs yet. So one of the things we've started working on in the last week or two has been actually starting integration with things like Splunk and Elasticstack to actually get you the logs when you get these things back. We'll actually be able to provide you a URL where you can go to read those. Uh, the other thing is with, in the same boat of the working with the Cube Archive API, is adding more filtering ability to those endpoints. Right now, it's only, you're just getting everything either in the namespace or on the cluster, but it will be, it, we want to be able to let you query based on names of these objects or labels they might have or other attributes of, that you might be interested in looking for. Additionally, we have handling missed cloud events. Right now, the sync receives the cloud events straight from the API server. So if the sync crashes or goes down or for any other reason, the network just doesn't route correctly, those cloud events are gone. But the Knative eventing provides ways to capture those missing events so that you can replay them once your sync is back up. That's something we're going to be starting on soon. We also don't have an alpha release yet. We're kind of pre-alpha at this point. But in the next few weeks, we plan to have an alpha release ready to make it easy for you to install. However, you can already just go to our repo, and we have a Helm chart that you can run to install what we had showed off today. And we're in the process of applying to the CNCF to become a sandbox project. And we're hoping that that goes well and that will be accepted in the next few months or so, quarter, give or take. So where can you learn more? We have a GitHub repo. Go to the GitHub repo. We've got all the stuff that we're working on is in there. We also have documentation. It's a work in progress, but we have instructions and work actively working on as we add more features to get things documented. We also have email lists. We have the Cube Archive email list, which will be used to notify you when new releases happen. We also have the Cube Archive developers email list, which is where email discussion will happen. And also, and uh, so yeah, give us a follow on GitHub. Join those, join the developers email list if you're interested. Um, so we got questions. Actually, you're out of time, and we've got another presentation coming. So what I'd like to do is ask if you want to yeah. take uh, query questions out in the hall, and, can, and we can prepare for the next presentation. Yeah. Sorry, guys.